is curious that only about three or four years ago, people talked rather vaguely about using atomic energy for power purposes. Formerly, the thought that it could be used for civil purposes was a kind of mental adventure. Now it is recognized that it is an economic proposition. It is clear that in the final analysis, it is the quality of the human beings that counts. We have to remember always that it is right education and good health that will lay the foundation for economic as well as cultural and spiritual progress. In the old days, the arts in India were encouraged more especially by the ruling princes and rich patrons. Now, the state has to encourage them. The state should help an academy or association, but should leave it free to function as it likes. That is broadly the policy we follow in regard to the Central Arts Academies. time has come for me to go away for some weeks from India and to bid you farewell for a while. I have received a large number of messages of good wishes on the eve of my departure. Those good wishes I shall carry with me and they shall keep me in good heart. Perhaps it is a good thing that for five weeks or so, you will not be troubled by my speeches and broadcasts. And so, goodbye to you for a while, and may good fortune rest with you. Jai Hind. India may be new to world politics, and her military strength insignificant in comparison with that of the giants of our epoch. But India is old in thought and experience and has traveled through trackless centuries in the adventure of life. Throughout her long history, she has stood for peace and every prayer that an Indian raises ends with an invocation to peace. It was out of this ancient and young India that Mahatma Gandhi arose and he taught us a technique of action that was peaceful. Yet it was effective and yielded results that led us not only to freedom, but to friendship with those with whom we were till yesterday in conflict. This is the basis and the goal of our foreign policy. We are neither blind to reality, nor do we propose to acquiesce in any challenge to man's freedom from whatever quarter it may come. Where freedom is menaced or justice threatened or where aggression takes place, we cannot be and shall not be neutral. What we plead for and endeavor to practice in our own imperfect way is a binding faith in peace and an unfailing endeavor of thought and action to ensure it. This concept of coexistence is thus basic to Indian thinking. Our own country is, is uh, full of its own problems, more particularly to give a better life to all our innumerable people. And that can only be done if there is peace. And so for us, peace is a passion. Not only a passion, but something that all our logic and mind drives us to as essential for our growth. The main purpose of the United Nations is to build up a world without war. A world based on cooperation of nations and peoples. I am equally convinced that if we aim at right ends, right means should be employed.
the more and more we live under a kind of regime of terror. Terror of what? Terror of some kind of catastrophe, like war descending upon us, some kind of disaster when nuclear weapons are used, and the future of the world, of the world's survival is in peril. I am no man of wisdom. I am only a person who has dabbled in public affairs for nearly half a century. Learned something from them, and mostly that I have learned is how wise men often behave in a very foolish manner. In ages long past, a great son of India, the Buddha, said that the only real victory is one in which all are equally victorious and there is defeat for no one. In the world today, that is the only practical victory. Any other way will lead to disaster. Truth is not confined to one country or one people. It has far too many aspects for anyone to presume that he knows all. And each country and each people, if they are true to themselves, have to find out their path themselves, through trial and error, through suffering and experience. Only then do they grow. We in India have sought to formulate the principles which should govern our relations with other countries and have often spoken of them as the five principles. What are these five principles? Panchashil. They are very simple. The first one is the recognition by the countries of their independence and each other's independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity. The second one is non-aggression. The third is non-interference with each other. The fourth is mutual respect and equality. And the fifth is coexistence. Our policy is neither neutral in that sense, nor passive. It is an active, positive policy, well, in favor of peace. Uh, holding on to certain objectives and ideals, and trying, in a friendly way, and in a small way, to influence events. We don't imagine that we can make a terrible lot of difference, but Sometimes, when things are in a balance, even a little tells. Bandung proclaimed the political emergence in political affairs of over half the world's population. Peaceful coexistence and non-alignment does not mean passivity of mind or action, lack of faith or conviction. It does not mean submission to what we consider evil. It is a positive and dynamic approach to such problems that confront us. We believe that each country has not only the right to freedom, but also to decide its own policy and way of life. We call ourselves non-aligned countries. The word non-aligned may be differently interpreted, but basically it is used with the meaning of being non-aligned with the great power blocks of the world. Non-aligned has a negative meaning, but if we give it a positive connotation, it means nations which object to lining up for war purposes to military blocks, to military alliances and the like. We keep away from such an approach and we want to throw our weight in favor of peace. Millions of people believe in what is called capitalism. Millions also believe in communism. But there are many millions who are not committed to either of these ideologies and yet seek friendship with others, a better life and a more hopeful future. We did not come to the Soviet Union as strangers, 
for many of us have followed with deep interest the great changes and developments that have taken place in this country. We are neighbor countries and it is right that there should be a feeling of neighborliness and friendship between us for the mutual advantage of both our countries and our people. I believe also that this friendship is good for the larger causes of the world and more particularly for the most vital cause of all, the peace of the world. I saw in the Soviet Union mighty tasks undertaken and many accomplished. I saw that the field of cooperation between our two countries was rich and wide. Excellency's visit to India will undoubtedly help in this process of deeper understanding and cooperation. Let our coming together be because we like each other and wish to cooperate and not because we dislike others and wish to do them injury. Let us also plan for the peaceful cooperation of different countries for the common good and elimination of war. जमाने को सोचकर जब आप हम तो हजारों लाखों When I think of the old days, how all of us here and hundreds of thousands of our countrymen together how we toiled, soaring high sometimes, in the depths of despair sometimes, and succeeded in spite of innumerable difficulties, with a single desire in our hearts and all our strength behind it. to complete our work. We shall never forget that day when India attained freedom after a long and hard struggle and great sufferings. A fresh wind began to blow again across the country and we decided to devote all our energies to build a new and prosperous India so that the people could move forward and strengthen the nation. मेरा पॉइंट जो है कि साथ साथ और चीजें दिखाई जाएं ताकि क्योंकि ये रिमोट एरिया में ये रोके गए 
ये रोकी गई है रिमार्क कर दो जो सब में अच्छी हमारी फिल्म से वो रोकी गई India was rightly regarded the country which stood for peace. We had become standard bearers of peace in the world. But weakness goes ill together with peace. Peace can be secured by strength and endeavor and not by complacency. That way alone can peace be secured in the world and our voice can be heard with respect. of India is determined to seek all peaceful avenues of settlement of the Sino-Indian differences on the border question, while taking necessary precautions against the repetition of the events of October and November 1962, it continues to follow the policy of non-alignment, peaceful coexistence and development in peace and freedom. I invite all of you to whatever religion or party or group you may belong to be comrades in this great struggle that has been forced upon us. I have full faith in our people and in the cause and in the future of our country. Jai Hind. My life, the very last part of it. It is occasionally frustrating and all that. 
but generally it's a satisfying life. That is, satisfaction really comes when one can fit in one's thought with one's action. I was never quite so satisfied in that sense as in the days of our struggle for independence. And especially in the early days, I was younger too. And I forgot everything, almost. Including my family, everything I saw them. I took them for granted. I forgot them. I was, I was uh, in a state of, what shall I say, um, a queer state of mind, concentrating in one thing. And uh, it's like an arrow from the bow which goes straight. But of course, that particular aspect listen, but to some extent it remains. It has remained. Mahatma Gandhi had said of him, 
When I am gone, Jawaharlal Nehru will speak my language. received so much love and affection from the Indian people that nothing I can do can repay even a small fraction of it. To my innumerable comrades and colleagues, I owe an even deeper debt of gratitude. We have been joint partners in great undertakings and have shared the triumphs and sorrows which inevitably accompany them. A small handful of my ashes should be thrown into the Ganga the Ganga has been to me a symbol and a memory of the past of India running into the present and flowing on to the great ocean of the future. And though I have discarded much of past tradition and customs and am anxious that India should rid herself of all shackles that bind and constrain her and divide her people and suppress vast numbers of them and prevent the free development of the body and the spirit, though I seek all this, yet I do not wish to cut myself off from the past completely. I am proud of that great inheritance that has been and is ours, and I am conscious that I too, like all of us, am a link in that unbroken chain which goes back to the dawn of history in the immemorial past of India. That chain I would not break, for I treasure it and seek inspiration from it. The major portion of my ashes should, however, be disposed of otherwise. I want these to be carried high up into the air in an aeroplane and scattered from that height over the fields where the peasants of India toil, so that they might mingle with the dust and soil of India and become an indistinguishable part of India. <laughs> 